I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here and also for organizing this conference in presence. And it's really great to be here with all of you and to be able to interact in person after such a long time. So this talk is uh, mainly based on this result here with Chaslav. And I will also briefly touch on these other uh, three results. One of them is still in preparation. And this is about the generalization of Einstein's equivalence principle to superpositions of gravitational fields by using a tool that some of you might be familiar with, which are quantum reference frames. And so um, actually it's great that Marcus just spoke because he provided the great motivation for uh, this work, which is to understand what happens if we put a massive body in a spatial superposition. And Marcus already explained all the experimental challenges and uh, also some of the conceptual challenges. And I would like to elaborate more on this, on the latter ones, which is, um, well, in, when we put a massive body in such a special superposition, then we are in a situation where we do not have a classical space time. And then in, uh, in this situation, uh, the, fundamental principles of uh, quantum theory and of gravity, uh, it is not clear how to put them together. And there might be a clash or maybe they can be generalized. And this is what we're going to do here. We want to generalize the Einstein equivalence principle. Because in the, the usual formulation of the Einstein equivalence principle does not hold. So uh, since the equivalence principle is one of our fund fundamental principles of general relativity, but it is also a very powerful experimental tool, then whatever we are going to find, whether it's valid or it's violated, is going to be interesting. Because in, in, in its generalization, uh, so if, if it is valid in, in a generalized form, then this can provide the conceptual basis for a theory at the interface of quantum theory and gravity in the low energy formulation, which is the regime in which, which we are addressing here. Well, if it's violated, we have elements that we can modify. And then here, I'm going to argue that in ge the generalized form, it is still valid. So let us first review what the Einstein equivalence principle is in uh, general relativity. So here we have a manifold and uh, a point P in this manifold, which is an arbitrary point. Then the Einstein equivalence principle tells us that there is a transformation, uh, a coordinate transformation to a local inertial frame, such that the metric in the new set of coordinates is locally Minkowskian. So it's Minkowski at this point P and something else uh, far away from this point. And also the first derivative of the metric is zero at this point. And this is the usual formulation that uh, is contained in the book Gravitation by Misner, Thorn and Wheeler. And you can see that it heavily rely, uh, relies on the notion of local inertial frame. So let's see mathematically what they are, because we are going to use them in the following to generalize the Einstein equivalence principle. So let us take a manifold and a point xp in this manifold. And let's use some coordinates that we call x. Then uh, we want to change to a local inertial frame, which has coordinates psi. And if we have a general transformation between x and psi, then we can expand it in Taylor series in, in a neighborhood of this point xp, which is the center of our local inertial frame. And the important thing here is that we only keep terms up to the linear term uh, in the expansion, and we don't need anything else. And this is going to be very important in the quantum version. And now let's look at the coefficient, at the first order coefficients. They form a four by four matrix. So we have 16 free parameters that we're free to choose. And general relativity tells us how the metric field transforms. And now, if, we only, if, we're, if we're only interested um, in the metric in xi equal to zero, which is, if you look at this expansion, xp, so it's at the origin of our local inertial frame, then 
we only need 10 quantities because the metric field is, uh, is a symmetric tensor. So uh, we can use uh, 10 of these 16 free parameters to uh, fix the, to, to choose basically what the metric field is going to be in the new coordinate system. And so we find that the metric field is locally Minkowski at uh, point psi equal to zero. And then we, it's something else when at higher order. And actually, uh, I don't have time to show it here, but it only has um, second order corrections. So also the first derivative you see is, is zero. So to recap, we have a two-step procedure. First, we reset, I'm sorry that you, you cannot see here, but this is an XP. Uh, so first, we recenter the reference frame around point XP, and then we stretch the coordinates so that it's locally Minkowski at the origin of the local inertial frame. So now, uh, local inertial frames are central to the definition of the Einstein equivalence principle. But if we think about it operationally, Einstein himself uh, regarded reference frames as physical rods and clocks, uh, which we can use to fix the point of views from which observations are carried out. But if we take physical rods and clocks, then these are quantum systems. And especially if we are interested in the regime in which quantum systems uh, are massive and can be placed in a superposition, then uh, these physical rods and clocks will also get entangled with, uh, with, the, with the mass that sources the gravitational field and with the gravitational field itself. So we want to consider a situation in which this picture here, where we have a classical system on classical space-time, is replaced with this picture, where we do not have word lines anymore, and also the metric is in a special superposition, is in a quantum superposition. And this is the setup that um, quantum reference frames can deal with. And in particular, we're going to use this formulation here that we introduced with Chaslav and Esteban in 2019, uh, which, well, in the original formulation, uh, we were talking about Galilean systems, so non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, the, the key was that we w wanted to associate a reference frame to a quantum system that is in a superposition of being at x1 and x2, for instance. And this is achieved via a controlled superposition of standard transformations. So in this case, it would be a control translation uh, where the control is uh, this quantum, the quantum state of our quantum reference frame. And what we find is that in the new quantum reference frame A, then if this, we started here with a product state, and this state is going to be entangled, but the relative distances are always the ones. So if A was in X1, then B will be in L minus X1 and C in minus X1. And if A was in X2, then B is in L minus X2 and C is in minus X2. So the, relat the, the relative distances are preserved, but in a quantum superposition. So now um, this uh, leads me to, the, to introducing our generalized Einstein equivalence principle, which rely is the same, so, but, but it relies on a new notion that is the quantum local inertial frames. So, um, so this is the statement, and now in the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to explain to you how to build a quantum local inertial frame. And in order to do that, I will need to introduce uh, a few notions, like the, how we describe the gravitational field, how we describe a quantum particle in uh, space-time and in a superposition of space-times as we will introduce it. So let's start. Uh, so the first thing that I'm, I'm going to explain is how to introduce, the, how to describe a particle, a quantum particle in space-time. So here we want to stick to a particle description. We do not want to go to field theory. And uh, we, are ado we adopt a um, covariant formulation where the quantum state is a quantum state in space-time. And at this level, 
we are going to we are not going to introduce any dynamics of this particle p but what i would like to stress and this is an intuition that derives from quantum reference frames is that whenever we write these coordinates here these are not abstract coordinates but these are distances between this particle and the origin of the quantum reference frame which is a quantum system so the origin is a system that we call R and provides our reference, but it is a quantum particle to which we associate um, the, uh, the quantum reference frame. Okay, so the second aspect is how to deal with the superposition of space times. So, of course, we do not have a complete theory of uh, quantum gravity and we do not even have a full theory to describe superposition of space times at low energies but we restrict to a situation where we make some assumptions so in particular uh, our in our regime we have that uh, gravitational fields produced by distinguishable mass distributions correspond to orthogonal quantum states and then um, each well-defined gravitational field is described by general relativity. So basically, for each one of these manifolds here, there is a classical gravitational field. And these gravitational fields can be put in a special, uh, in a quantum superposition. And we assume, uh, furthermore, that the quantum superposition principle holds in this regime. So now uh, we know that uh, in general relativity, so the, the gravitational field is defined everywhere. But then if we want to get information about the gravitational field, we use a physical system. So we use a probe particle which interacts with the gravitational field and uh, we can extract information locally about the gravitational field. So classically, what what happens is that we have a classical particle that we call M, and at some point along the word line of this particle, we have a point, and the, thanks to the interaction of this particle with the gravitational field, we know how the gravitational field correlates with the, value, with the position of this particle. So the position of a particle M defines a physical point thanks to the, so it's, it's, a, it's a coincidence um, in space time at which the metric field is evaluated. So now we want to replace this quantum particle with a quantum system, which does not have a word line anymore. So we introduce a quantum state in space and time, so in space time for this particle, and then we apply this reasoning here in a quantum superposition. So what, what we're going to have is that, is that for every position that this quantum particle has in space-time, there is a value of the gravitational field associated to it. And of course, this is not a full description. It's I don't want to be complete. I don't want to... Uh, this is just uh, an operational reasoning to extract information locally on the gravitational field. And now the, we have a situation where we have a superposition of space times. So we also would like to address this situation and to uh, identify points across space time. And we do that once again using quantum, re uh, quantum reference frames reasoning, which is that we have at the origin of our quantum reference frame, uh, which is across space time so across the different space times, is a particle, is a quantum particle. And this quantum particle has some distance with the, uh, with every, with the quantum system. So we, uh, the points across different uh, manifolds are identified by looking at the distance between the particle, which is the origin of our quantum reference frame, and the quantum system that we are considering. So um, now I can introduce finally the Einstein equivalence principle for quantum reference frames. And 
So the idea is uh, to take the transformation to a local inertial frame and to generalize it to a situation where we have a quantum particle that is in a uh, superposition in space-time and also a superposition of space-times. And we will see that this is achieved by applying the principle of linear superposition twice. Once within the same space-time, so for each pos possible position of the particle P, which will be our final quantum reference frame, and once across different space-times, so for each solution of the classical gravitational field. And uh, so, remember at the beginning when I, uh, I introduced the local inertial frames, I uh, pointed you to at the, this matrix of linear coefficients of the Taylor expansion of the transformation between two uh, reference frames. And they said that these are 16 free parameters. So we will see that the uh, key to achieve this generalization of the local inertial frame transformation is to take a different f for each point xp and for each solution uh, i of the gravitational field. But once we do that, then uh, we know how the metric field transforms once we fix xp and once we fix i, so the different gi. So I'm labeling with i the g1, g2, g3 across the different manifolds. And we also know how to evaluate it, thanks to the identification that we did across the different space-times. So basically, it works in the same way, but just in a quantum superposition. So let's see more in detail how it works. And let's uh, start with just a, a standard, with, with a classical curved space-time. So we only consider one manifold and one solution of the gravitational field. And on this manifold, we have a quantum particle P, which is our, so the initial reference frame, we call it R. And the particle P is our final quantum reference frame. And we describe it in the way I introduced before as a state, quantum state in space and time. And then we have a gravitational field G, which uh, has, uh, so which we probe through this particle M which, uh, is ex which is correlated in this way with the gravitational field. Okay. And as I said before, in order to go to the uh, local inertial frame that is centered in this quantum particle P, we have to take a different transformation for each possible location of particle P uh, that is possible. And remember that there was this two-step procedure to go to a local inertial frame to center the origin in xp and to straight the coordinates. But now we do it, we do a different one for each xp. And if you remember, the key of, to, to achieve the local inertial frame transformation was to use a linear Taylor expansion. So here you can see that the relation between xi and xm, which is uh, uh, the, the manifold that we're going to change, is linear. So this means that this relation can be implemented by a unitary operator. And we call this operator si. So for each position xp, we have a, a different, uh, so we, we have an s, and for each, um, and, and, and then the transformation xi is a control transformation on the state of p. Uh, so it's a unitary transformation that is controlled on the state of p. So the particle p acts as a control, and uh, then the transformation, the target would be the particle m. And then we also, this leads us to change the, also the state of g. So when we uh, generalize this to the superposition of 
classical gravitational field, so we have a set of manifolds, then basically for each manifold we have the situation that we saw in the previous slide. The only thing that we need to add is the sum over all possible manifolds, because remember we can write this because the linear superposition principle holds across the different manifolds. So again, we have the same reasoning, but this time, instead of just linearly superposing in XP, we also need to superpose for each manifold that we are considering. But again, uh, the transformation between the new and the old set of coordinates is linear, so this can also be implemented as a unitary operation, but this time it is controlled both on XP, so on particle P, and on the manifold that we have. So we're going to have a different transformation for each XP and for each space-time that we consider. So once we perform this transformation, so we have the, the initial state of particle P and the state of the gravitational field and of particle M, and we apply this unitary transformation on this quantum state. But now we want to check that at the origin of the new uh, quantum local inertial frame, we have Minkowski. And we do that by evaluating this state at the origin of the quantum local inertial frame. And when we do that, we find that regardless of what I started with, so if I, had, I could have had any quantum state of the particle P, any su superposition of different manifolds, but I find that for xi equal to zero, I have Minkowski at the origin, and then this is, it, it is in a quantum superposition uh, far away well, in a neighborhood of the central point of the quantum local inertial frame. So this generalizes the uh, Einstein equivalence principle to quantum reference frames and to um, the superposition of gravitational fields. And now let me just add a few comments, a few final comments. And this is uh, a paper with Chaslav that came out yesterday on the archive. So, the, the, more on the conceptual implications of this result. Um, so, I mentioned at the beginning that at the interface of quantum theory and gravity, the, it is usually thought that the uh, fundamental principles uh, clash, and in particular, uh, Roger Penrose uh, uh, argued in a couple of papers that the when I put a massive particle in a super quantum superposition, then the principle of linear superposition and the Einstein equivalence principle do not go well together. So we have to give up one of them, and he puts general relativity first. So he argues that the, we should abandon the principle of linear superposition. And this led to the famous uh, proposal of a spontaneous state reduction, where one of the two branches would die off, and the, basically the, the space-time would go back to being a classical space-time to save the Einstein equivalence principle. Uh, what I would like to argue here is that there is another possibility, which is to extend it as we did with Chaslav, and this would allow us to reconcile the principle of linear superposition with the Einstein equivalence principle. And finally, the last thing I would like to say is, is there a hope to test this generalized Einstein equivalence principle? So this is an ongoing work with a master's student. And uh, what we did, I will just briefly sketch it. So we consider a simplified situation, which is uh, an interferometer with entangled clocks, which is placed in the gravitational field of the Earth. And the statement of the Einstein, this generalized Einstein equivalence principle is that the Einstein equivalence principle should hold in every quantum reference frame. So in particular, if these clocks are in a superposition of gravitational, uh, sorry, in a quantum superposition in the gravitational field of the Earth, it should also hold for um, in the quantum reference frame of this clock. And we know how to go to this quantum reference frame. And 
Okay, we used in particular uh, a, di a slightly different formulation, which, well, at least according to me, is compatible with what I've presented bef before, uh, which uh, came out in this paper here. And um, where in particular we can add also the state of a clock to, to the formalism. And we find that there is a superposition of gravitational time dilation as seen from the perspective of one of these quantum clocks. And um, this result uh, is, uh, resonates with a previous result, uh, where, which was, well, a paper by Esteban, myself, Alessio, and Chaslav, uh, where, again, we, ha we also have a relative localization in time it is conceptually very similar, but it is physically dif a different effect because here we had um, that the relative localization came from the interaction between clocks. Here, uh, there is no interaction, but it just comes from the fact that the clocks are in a superposition, uh, in position or velocity in, um, uh, in, in space. And so in any case, we took this, um, with uh, Carlo took this, um, this formalism here, and he proposed a, a violation of the, this generalized Einstein equivalence principle. And what one finds is that the, if the Einstein, this generalized Einstein equivalence principle is violated, then it is impossible to have, um, to define a time evolution in the quantum reference frame of these clocks. While if it is preserved, then time in the clock frame flows naturally, and one clock would see the other clocks as ticking in a quantum superposition of time dilations. So this is everything I wanted to tell you. And to conclude, uh, I will just wrap up and summarize what I've said. So this is a generalization of quantum reference frames to curved space-times and superposition of space-times. And we have seen that this generalization relies on the introduction of the notion of a quantum local inertial frame. And the main, um, the main take-home message is that we can generalize the Einstein equivalence principle in the following way. For every quantum state of a system P living in a superposition of classical space-times, one can find a quantum local inertial frame transformation to the quantum reference frame of P, such that the metric is locally Minkowski at the origin of the quantum reference frame. And what I didn't have time to cover is that I've, uh, I've told you everything uh, with a frozen state, so I didn't assign any dynamics of the state, but with Chaslav we also uh, consider a, a freely falling particle in uh, space-time, and we showed that we can also define um, a superposition, a, a transformation to the freely falling frame of a quantum system in space-time and in a superposition of space-times. Uh, so, a, for people who are familiar with Fermi normal coordinates, a superposition of Fermi normal coordinates transformation. And this is all. Thank you. This is not PI, it's Toronto, but... <laughs> <laughs>
So it's not really the metric itself, but it's the metric with respect to that coordinate yes. system. Yes, exactly. That's the statement. Yes. Okay, then I'm already happy. Thanks. <gasps> Good. More questions? Okay, let's go online then. So it's not really a new question, but it's more trying to understand the previous one and the answer to that. Uh, so the the statement that the that the geometry is flat is is not a matter of a coordinate frame. Uh, so it could be that in the practical implementation you have to you have to use metrics and you cannot speak of geometries, and so you have to refer to specific uh, coordinate frames in order to make statements about the metric, but. If I say that uh, I have a geometry which is the flat uh, Minkowski geometry, that has nothing to do a priori with any coordinate frame. Yeah, so, okay. So yeah, it, it is not flat, it is Minkowskian, so it's local inertial. So we are not talking about curvature or like scalar curvature, Ricci, Riemann curvature. It's just like the usual statement of the Einstein equivalence principle, which you can make, you can make it look uh, inertial at a point, but of course the curvature is always non-zero, if it was originally non-zero. All right, so I think we have online question. Hello. Very good. Hello. Hello, we hear you. You can ask. Yeah, can I go forward with the question? Of course. Uh, yeah, maybe this is uh, a bit uh, trivial or naive, but I think uh, 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 the 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 problem of a uh, falling mass in a gravitational field, if um, if solved by just Schrodinger's equation, has a inertial mass uh, as well as a uh, gravitational mass in the form of potential on the right hand side and nothing on the left hand side so the actual motion actually is depending upon the mass uh, whereas in classical uh, equations the masses actually the inertial and the gravitational masses actually ca cancel around that's how we get the equivalence principle but here the equation showing the equation itself depends upon the two masses which do not cancel up so isn't that violating the equivalence principle in the first place? Like different quantum particles falling at different rates because they have this mass dependence. Okay, Shashang, I think we have a problem. I'm not sure whether neither me or Flaminia understood your question. Can you shortly summarize, please, once more? I apologize, your question. Uh, I'm just saying the equivalence principle, uh, how is it uh, valid with the quantum mechanics? The, the Schrodinger's equations depend upon the inertial mass and the gravitational mass and the masses don't cancel out like they do in classical mechanics. So how exactly is the, I'm just saying that the motion of a quantum particle is dependent on its mass uh, in the, in, with the gravitational field. So the masses don't cancel out on both the sides like they do in classical mechanics. Just saying, is the quantum is the equivalence principle even valid in, in in quantum mechanics? So I I didn't talk about the the freely falling masses in this uh, uh, in this talk. So this is in the paper and it's it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but uh, so so there is no mass uh, involved here because it it's not freely falling. But it's just this is about the uh, generalization of the notion of a local inertial frame transformation to a particle that is in a quantum superposition in space-time and in a superposition of gravitational fields. So there's no Schrodinger equation at this level. Mm -hmm. And why exactly uh, do you need the quantum reference frames in the first place? Like uh, coordinates do not have any metrical significance, so you could have chosen any local inertial frame and used any old coordinates, uh, I mean, we don't need uh, rods and clocks to actually measure things. We need just the metric and the metric is given by the Einstein equation. So uh, why exactly do we no need quantum reference? frame? we can just change to any coordinates and 
they don't have any metrical significance so well because we are not in a standard general relativistic situation we are in a situation where you have a quantum system that is the source of a gravitational field so you want to consider more general situations than what gr would uh, give you that's our setup I think just how you wanted to add something. Uh, no, I mean, just uh, I wanted to uh, clarify something which is usually known to everybody. I mean, I all uh, agreed with everything what Flaminia said, but uh, this question reminded me on this kind of uh, uh, sometimes in the literature, even in the case of a fixed background, uh, gravitational background, people use to write that the equivalence principle is violated by quantum particles because you know, the mass uh, uh, figures in the dynamical equations. But this is true also for the free, free particle, the mass, for example, influences the dispersion of the wave packet. And the equivalence principle just tells you that in a freely falling frame, everything should be just like in inertial frame. And if in inertial frame it depends on mass, and it's totally fine it depends on, on the mass also in the freely falling reference frame. I, I mean, this is even a little bit not addressing the question, but just it remind me on this, and I think maybe for people who are not in the field, it, it should be repeated again and again. Okay, good. So we have, I think, one more online question. Please. Natalia, can you hear us? Um, hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, all good. Uh uh, Flaminia, thank you for your uh, for your talk. Uh, I have one question related to your, um, I think your last slide. Are you dealing with any gravitational field or just in a weak gravitational field limit? No, it's a Newtonian. It's a Newtonian situation, so it's just a weak field limit. Ah, okay, because of that, you can talk about Minkowski uh, in, uh, in space time. Okay, thank you a lot. Good. More questions? Okay, I can ask something perhaps now you, perhaps I could have asked you already this, but this is this space-time cat that you write. You, I think, I don't remember that you, that you mentioned measurements and, and what's the operational, let's say, meaning of this wave function. What, what are the probabilities? How do you go to probabilities? The one in space-time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, at, at this level, what, what I presented, there, there is, uh, I mean, it's not clear, I agree. <laughs> so you're right to complain. But um, so what happens actually is that once you, so this is equi an equivalent formulation. So you have a quantum state in space time, but then you enforce the dynamics with a constraint. So the constraint removes one degree of freedom. So in the end, the degrees of freedom that you have are the same as in the standard Schrodinger equation. And by enforcing this constraint, you remove this redundancy. And, and then the, like the, the state that you call the physical state is fully equivalent to the one that you would get by the, well, the Schrodinger equation in the non-relativistic case. I see. So it's kind of standard thing. It's not something like distribution of over space-time clicks no. or something like that. I mean, it's this actually opens the possibility of having a superposition in coordinate time, but then in the end, you will, we are going to fix a reference frame. So once you fix the reference frame. Okay, I see. And, and maybe f to just to follow the, 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 the last thing I, I would like to ask is, um, so well, let's say you use some kind of basic rule superposition principle to superimpose all possible classical situations. Um, that's kind of cookbook how you, and you said we are doing this because there is no consistent or satisfactory theory of gravity. I guess many people would disagree on this point. What, suppose I take a loop quantum gravity, although it's like I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with this, but can you do these things in, within such a framework or, or, or this is, some, or it's impossible or it's possible or, can you comment on this? I think that there are some people in the audience who are <laughs> more competent than me in loop quantum gravity. So if they want to say something on... <laughs> maybe any, any, any other quantum gravity approach, right? So that... Or just or maybe you want to comment, do you know anything on these lines? <laughs> <laughs> because I thought so... I guess... Right? Yes. 
Yeah, maybe you can comment. I mean, they are better experts in loop quantum gravity than me, <laughs> but they didn't raise their hand. Um, it's not clear what is the what is the relation between quantum reference frames and loop quantum gravity. Not least because. Um, they work in the, it's not even the weak limit, it's the Newtonian limit, um, which is, how to say? Are you saying you wouldn't know how to start this thing? There is a big open problem, which is how you recover uh, in, a, you know, in a very clean and satisfying way the very low energy limit. So, given that this is working in that extreme and loop quantum gravity is an approach that mainly is geared to solve non-perturbative uh, problems. So the deep quantum gravity regime, it's they're neither contradictory nor, it's, it's very interesting. I think many people are interested to see how you could import this kind of uh, form, formalism. You wanna say something, Daniel? So in the, the the answer is, uh, if we have more than uh, five minutes, then there are a lot of things we could say, and there are some things we know, others we are not sure about. The condensed version is, uh, we're not sure about it. Okay, good. Okay. okay, I think it's a good moment to stop now. We have our break. Let's first, let's thank Flaminia once more. Thank you. Thank you.